Vitesh Naf, welcome to Validated. Great to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Good to have you on today. So we're going to be talking about a bunch of stuff today. All of these things relating to the intersection of, I would say, a lot of concepts that are reviled in TradFi uh, and the intersection of that and stuff in DeFi and blockchain. I think what's what's interesting here is a lot of the systems that have been built up that revolve around order flow in the traditional financial space. Like this really came to a head with like GameStop and you know AMC and Robinhood and like that whole sort of thing uh, back a few years ago. But a lot of those concepts, if you actually break them apart and decentralize them and build open access, actually become very interesting. I think a lot of those are misunderstood. So you know you guys are building DeFlow. Obviously, we're talking about decentralized order flow, a bunch of other types of things. So I want to get into this, but I want to kind of start at the TradFi model, which I think a lot of people will have some understanding of how this stuff often works in the TradFi space, but not necessarily a deep understanding about how this can actually be positive and in some cases negative, and a lot of it's in the implementation details. So would love to kind of just start with the TradFi space and then move into uh, the work you guys are doing on blockchain. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, so in, in equities markets, there's this market mechanism called payment for order flow, which uh, is kind of poorly named, but at the same time not so poorly named. It's this idea that, uh, that market makers can effectively purchase order flow from, from brokerages, and the market makers can um, basically either internalize this order flow or route it to an exchange um, and are acting essentially as execution agents on behalf of the brokerages. Um, this, this market mechanism has uh, pros and cons. I think um, the, the pros are effectively that a lot of these brokerages are getting, um, in some cases, better execution quality, or at least that's the idea, uh, than they would if they went directly to exchanges. The cons are the typical cons of traditional finance. There's a lot of I think, um, obscurity and obfuscation around, uh, are these prices actually better? Um, and, uh, you know, how do you enforce that the market makers aren't doing nefarious things? Um, I'll, I'll add one thing. I think our, our motivation in kind of how we think about like crypto markets and decentralized markets, as opposed to equities markets are, you really want to maintain the ethos of crypto and kind of like focus on the removal of middlemen and um, uh, and kind of take the good things from from the ideas behind payment for order flow and not actually take payment for order flow, but you know take the good things about it and bring it to crypto. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of those things where every sufficiently complex system can be explained in a way that makes it look evil or can be explained in a way that makes it look virtuous. Yeah. This is like a, uh, you know, Order flow became almost like a politically polarized topic um, around what was happening with Robinhood and GameStop and AMC and a bunch of other of these sort of meme coin uh, stocks, for lack of a better term. Um, but you know, I think like if you look at this stuff in the abstract, the idea that someone who is paying for order flow, there's obviously an economic incentive for them to pay for that order flow. Otherwise, they wouldn't be paying for it. Mm -hmm. And the perception in a lot of people's minds is the fact that they're paying is because they can do something nefarious with those orders. And this is sort of the idea of like, oh, they're routing them to places where the prices aren't maybe as good, or they're somehow exploiting that compared to what a quote unquote pure exchange would be doing. Um, now, there's a lot in U.S. regulation that actually means that's not taking place. Like there, there are requirements to get good pricing on exchanges with a certain margin of error when it comes to this stuff. But like, walk me through a little bit of how this stuff is designed to work in sort of the ideal setting, and then what are some of the shortcomings that have come through in traditional finance? Yeah, the the uh, Reg NMS is regulation that basically. Um, enforces or attempts to enforce the idea that brokerages should get good execution quality. And one of the main kind of pillars of Reg NMS is the NBBO. And it, it states uh, at a high level that when a brokerage, brokerage routes order flow to a market maker, the market maker must execute it at what the NBBO believes is the best price. Yeah. There are lots of problems with this. I think the current SEC chair doesn't believe that the NBBO is a good, I think, measuring stick for what best execution actually looks like. Um, 
Uh, he he may be right on that. I'm not I'm not a PFOF expert, um, but I think the the idea behind kind of as we build DeFi into a system that can eat tradfi is to avoid a lot of these shortcomings of is this actually best execution? I think one underappreciated concept in in crypto today is that PFOF has been here for quite some time. Hmm. If you look at you know order flow auctions on Ethereum. Um, that is exactly PFOF. It's just PFOF without any of the uh, regulatory kind of like support systems that um, make it approximately okay. Similarly, when a validator goes to a searcher and strikes a handshake deal, yep. that's a form of PFOF. And uh, all of this is extremely nefarious. It happens in crypto. And um, a lot of what motivates me is to you know, stop that stuff from happening. And, and that's, yeah, a, a lot of what drives how I think about the space. Yeah, we've talked about MEV a few times on the show. Um, one of the things that I think people maybe don't appreciate there is, you know, that is a system where expressly there is an action available that will cost the user more and will earn the person executing a MEV transaction more. And there, there's parasitic MEV, there's non-parasitic MEV, right? There's lots of, again, any sufficiently complicated system can be either good or bad or neutral in the way you describe it. Um, I think what we've seen on many areas is, you know, when you're trading now in a lot of these decentralized venues, the slippage is effectively what you always pay, right? If you set yep. a maximum slippage of 1%, you will pay 1% slippage because the MEV systems now are so good that they're going to assess your tolerance for price slippage and maximize that to the fullest. How is that similar or different from what happens in the regulated TradFi market? Yeah, so order books in the regulated TradFi markets are um, they're, they're built on different microstructure, effectively. And the microstructure of order books on Solana, or just generally any mm -hmm. venue that offers liquidity on Solana, is inherently built on the Solana blockchain. So all of these venues adopt the microstructure of the Solana blockchain in terms of how transactions are propagated across the world, how they settle into blocks. And so that's, that's one thing you have to consider. But the uh, the conclusion of the differences between these two um, systems is is effectively that in TradFi today you see execution quality uh, be much higher than than what you see in crypto. Yeah, uh, users. Yeah, it's one one percent slippage is unheard of when you're trading equities. Yeah, and this is this is one of the kind of funny things where one of the reasons a lot of these like TradFi firms love trading in crypto is they're actually able to have higher profit margins than for some of that work in the TradFi space. Yeah, I think I think that's right. There, there are two angles to it, actually. So if you look at it from a liquidity-making perspective as well as a liquidity-taking perspective, um, liquidity-making is, is quite hard on-chain. Yeah. And it's the reason why, I think, over the past couple months, Solana interest has exploded. There's been a ton of trading volume, and there's been a ton of like user interest. But if you look at like how much liquidity there is on chain, yeah. it's remained effectively flat. The reason is it's just hard to come and provide liquidity. On yeah. the other hand, it's great. It's a great place to take liquidity because you have access to sophisticated tools that will help you order transactions in a certain way. Um, and so, from that sense, you're completely right. Yeah. So, just to dive into that, what about liquidity provisioning is difficult. I would say that there's um, a systematic imbalance that favors liquidity takers over liquidity makers. And the fundamental kind of like kernel of truth that this stems from is the fact that validators are in a position where they can, they have this privilege of ordering transactions how they choose to. And yes, of course, many validators are going to do the right thing. But at the same time, many validators are going to do the wrong thing and strike handshake deals with with searchers and, um, uh, you know, Gito is an incredible team with a long-term conviction. I applaud them on turning the mempool service off, but the mempool service was one of the things that facilitated this systematic imbalance against yeah. uh, against liquidity providers. Interesting. Yeah, we had um, we had Jerry from Phoenix on a little while ago, and he was saying a very similar structure um, yeah. when they deal with some of the problems with growing and scaling Phoenix. Yeah. So I want to pivot a little bit and talk about 
Dflow. Um, so let's start off with just like give us an overview of what it is, how it works, and then I want to get into some of the background of where you guys saw opportunity to create this type of a service. Definitely. So Dflow is an order flow segmentation protocol that helps DEXs distinguish between real users, humans, and bots. Um, the other service that we're building on top of our protocol is a swap API. So it's a mm -hmm. next generation aggregator that uses the market structure that we're building at the protocol level to offer tighter spreads and better liquidity to users that are swapping. The idea behind Dflow um, is effectively one of humans versus bots. Mm -hmm. And I think to uh, just dive into a quick uh, you know, short summary of what it is. Would love to actually start with some definitions on what order flow is and what toxicity is, because these two go hand in hand with how we've thought about constructing the protocol and the market mechanisms. So order flow, this may be obvious to some of your listeners, maybe not, but order flow is, is effectively a stream of buy and sell transactions. It's a stream of buy and sell orders or a stream of swap transactions. Order flow has this property, this statistical property of toxicity, where uh, a stream of uh, a stream of buy and sell or swap transactions can be toxic or it can be non-toxic, and it's and it's on a spectrum. The idea behind uh, toxicity is that if order flow is toxic, it imposes a cost on the liquidity provider, hmm. and this could be a market maker on Phoenix. This could be a retail LP on Orca. Um, and it will, for the retail LP, damage their yield, and for the market maker, it will um, it will reduce their spread that they capture. So the the idea behind Dflow is if we can give a way to these dexes on chain, protected by consensus, to know approximately with some probabilistic certainty what the toxicity of a transaction is, then that dex can choose to specialize its behavior. The dex can widen or increase fees for toxic order flow and decrease fees for non-toxic order flow. So what ends up happening is if you're a searcher and you're spamming the network, um, you need much more of a incentive to do so, a much, much wider profit mm -hmm. margin if you have to pay higher fees, protected by consensus, because this is on-chain code we're talking about. Right. Um, and if you're a real human, you get tighter spreads and and better liquidity, effectively exclusive liquidity um, when you're trading on chain, which helps with things like transaction rate inclusions. You won't have multiple failed swaps in a row, and you'll just see better prices and, and more liquidity. Yeah. So I, I kind of want to dig into this a little bit because like toxicity is always a an interesting term because there's one component to look at this and say it's toxic from the perspective of those providing LP, but it is beneficial from the perspective of the person sending it, yeah. right? And so, like, when we're talking about this, like, this symmetry of, of what our frame of reference is when we look at this, um, how is this sort of addressed in the TradFi space? Yeah, so the reason why I think Payment for Order Flow is not a great name mm -hmm. is because Payment for Order Flow um, takes this idea that humans or, you know, like retail users of a brokerage should get better pricing than, let's say, your large HFT prop trading firm. Sure. Um, because the LPs, in this case market makers, know that, hey, the user that I'm trading with is um, sending non-toxic order flow. It's not going to damage the spread that I capture. So I'm happy to give them better pricing. Hmm. This idea of, of payment for order flow in, in the sense of um, uh, adjusting the cost so that prop trading firms have to pay more and humans pay less is not a bad idea. What's bad about payment for order flow is the mechanism of how it's actually implemented and kind of like the disincentives that are created. In crypto, you get a much more elegant system where you can take the good parts of this mechanism that uh, tighten the spread for users, for real users, and widen for prop trading firms uh, or searchers. Right. Just to address your question of like it's good for some takers and it's you know it, it, it like uh, it's bad for liquidity providers. The the winners and losers, if we kind of have to enumerate them, the winners in a system where Dflow helps tighten the spread for non toxic flow is real users and liquidity providers, mm -hmm. and the losers are searchers and uh, like you know HFT prop firms that 
that want to send toxic flow and spam the network. Um, and I, I think that's fair. I don't think this is a mechanism that um, every venue will adopt, but for the venues that do adopt it, they're choosing to reward humans and, and, uh, right. um, and yeah, increase their trading volume, capture more fees more. Yeah, the reason I ask about it is because, you know, in some circles, and they tend to be more progressive circles, payment for order flow is seen as a way to buy dumb money, right? And sort of the idea of like, oh, the liquidity providers are now trading against less sophisticated people, and therefore they're able to, like, you sort of flip it the other way, right? Which is like, from from one perspective, you can say, oh, this is toxic order flow. The other version of that is, oh, this is toxic liquidity, Right. These are these are market makers on the liquidity side that are actually uh, buying users order flows because they know those users are less sophisticated than the professional traders. And so they can make more money off of that. How do you sort of think about that structure in, in, in TradFi? Is that an accurate way to look at it? Or is that sort of missing a key component of how these systems are designed to work? So I think um, TradFi PFOF is is flawed. In, in the sense that um, it is it is actually uh, basically a rebate that's being given to brokerages when um, when these market makers are executing those orders and and that broke that that rebate is given in the form of you know US dollars I think dflow is is not pfof in yeah. the sense that this is not the market mechanism that we're implementing you know we Starkly, we don't want to see the Robin Hood Citadel dynamic in crypto. That's right. not what crypto is about. Um, so I, I do think the TradFi PFOF model is is pretty broken. I, I don't mm-hmm. want to see it in crypto. Um, but I, I think there is a real problem of you know humans versus bots that needs to be solved. So yeah. that's where we are. So so walk us through a little bit. How does DFlow actually identify types of order flow? Um, and then what kind of what is it providing? Because you know in this space you are talking to other smart contracts, right? When when you are sort of providing data around order flow, it's not going into some off-chain system where people are able to compute all these things and sort of respond in real time. These are decentralized permissionless systems talking to other decentralized permissionless systems on a blockchain. So so how does that interplay between something you are potentially giving a signal to, um, you know, an order book about? How What does that interplay... It's a very poorly phrased question, but I think you get kind of... (laughs) Yeah, I I understand. So I think the first thing is what we're doing is releasing a protocol. So um, at the protocol layer of what we're building, everything we ship is decentralized code that runs on the Solana blockchain. Yeah. But fundamentally, this system introduces the concept of a network of endorsers. And an endorser is an economically motivated off-chain third party that anyone can run. Hmm. And the endorser's only job is to endorse order flow with a signature uh, that says this order flow has a toxicity rating and this this order flow is either toxic or non-toxic or on some spectrum hmm. within. And it's, it's totally up to whoever runs an endorser to decide uh, how to construct their endorsement algorithm and basically give in endorsement to a transaction, a swap transaction. So specifically, kind of at a technical level, what exactly is an endorsement? It's an ED25519 instruction. So uh, an ED25519 program is you know, one of Solana's native programs. Um, it allows the verification of a message and a signature. And so endorsers will uh, return this kind of like instruction that include that gets included in the list of instructions that form the, tr- the swap transaction, um, and on chain uh, dexes through the Dflow protocol have the ability now to um, go and parse basically what this toxicity rating is and uh, specialize or branch um, on hey is this toxicity rating high is it low and I think a key thing to emphasize here is all of this happens. Uh, permissionlessly. Endorsers can can kind of choose exactly how they want to construct their endorsement algorithms. DEXs can choose how they want to parse toxicity. All that Dflow is doing is enabling this communication to happen. It's giving more information um, to DEXs so that they have the ability to protect their LPs and, and protect against uh, searchers. Yeah, because I mean, I think the, the thing you're talking about before about how liquidity is fundamentally not increasing that much is like, 
it, it's a serious concern, I think. Like, you'll yep. see some of these meme coins that have tens of thousands of dollars of liquidity available, which mm-hmm. it's quite impressive that the actual order books can make use of that to still create like fairly efficient markets for, for yep. certain volumes of trading, but it's very thin markets when we tend to see it. So, how does uh like I want to dive in a little bit on that endorser method and how that actually works and how you prevent that from being sibled? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I think to start the uh, the question of increasing liquidity on chain. Uh, I'll work backwards from there yeah. to your question. Dflow is not a system that will magically make more liquidity appear on chain. You know, it's it's not a protocol that can force anyone to deposit capital anywhere. Um, but there are market if structural reasons, <laughs> of course, if only. There, there are market structural reasons why liquidity providers don't deposit capital. And so Dflow wants to eradicate those market structural reasons so that liquidity can come on chain and, uh, and, and make trading a better experience. Um, the way that uh, this endorser system works, because of course it's permissionless to run an endorser, um, is through uh, basically attaching a public key to every endorser. And so, of course, if an right. endorser is signing transactions with the private key, they have a public key. The DEX on-chain can go and say, uh, the combination of these two uh, fields of information, the toxicity rating and the public key of the endorser, um, the, these two pieces of information will allow me to uh, choose what the correct fee should be for this transaction. And I think a common observation that people have about this system is that um, this is a lot of information to construct, and and you basically end up with this huge table yeah. of like how do you set the fees. This this is a really good point, and I think it's it's something that's inherent. It's it's a physical property of the system. It's inherent to the nature of the business because. Toxicity, as I mentioned earlier, is is a statistical property of order flow, um, but toxicity is not a stationary distribution. It, you know, the the toxicity of a transaction is sampled from a non-stationary distribution. It changes over time, and so if this inherently changes over time, you do need a way for um, to express kind of that full field of information. And so you just you simply need this information on chain yeah. um, in order to actually achieve this. Interesting. So this may be kind of a silly question, but are you assessing the toxicity of an individual order or a stream of orders that are coming in? Yeah. So an individual individual orders make up the stream of orders, right? So um, the uh, the endorser. This is actually entirely up to the endorser how they want yeah. to uh, assess the toxicity. They can say. Every single order inside of this stream of orders has the same toxicity. They can be more multidimensional about it and and choose to say that certain orders have more toxicity than other orders. But in aggregate, this is the toxicity of the order flow. And so, it, yeah, it really just depends on who the endorser right. is and how they choose to construct their algorithm. So, how do you deal with things like introduce latency in this system? Because um, anything that involves signing something will involve a certain amount of delay within that system. And Solana DeFi moves pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, this this is a good question, but um, the overall latency of the system is not going to change from this. Um, the time, the, the time, because uh, effectively this is an additional network hop at most. Okay. And, and uh, that additional network hop already generally happens when you go and you know swap in your favorite wallet. Um, you're making network calls to you know whoever your swap provider is. Um, so this is this is a, a network hop that can get batched into that. But the more I, I think the broader point is like by the time most users you know like go to their mouse and like move their mouse to the swap button, sure. like that That's amount of time is bigger than the amount of time it takes for this endorsement. Right, which is interesting. So what you would expect in this model is that certain types of orders will come with endorsements, and that might be an integration you have with Soulflare or Phantom or Backpack or something like that. But then the folks who are running bots are obviously not going to be passing that through that system, right? These these are yep. optional add-ons. It's not like a DeFi protocol could say, 
Uh, we are only accepting orders through this endpoint, and everything that goes through the endpoint has an endorsement. That's right. Yeah, this is this is one way to look at the um, uh, the fee market and spam problem on Solana, actually. Yeah. Because now you have all of these searchers who were previously spamming the network and the validator clients. Um, what they're going to try and do is spam endorsers. And right. endorsers are... Um, they have much more of a design space for mm. blocking these spam transactions. This is a problem that you know computer scientists have worked on for decades, and uh, they've gotten really good at it. So um, yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. So let's just say I'm running a DeFi protocol, mm. and there are transactions coming in that are flagged as a higher level of toxicity than I'm comfortable with. What tools do I have on the smart contract program deployed on chain to actually respond to toxic order flow? Yeah, these these tools are baked into the SVM today. So there's uh, instruction introspection, mm -hmm. which lets you um, look at the toxicity of the order flow in uh, in a system where an endorser has endorsed it, um, and you effectively you get a number out of that, and you can look at the number and say is this number representative of toxic order flow or not? Um, prior to Dflow and prior to the system, you have absolutely no way of doing this as a yeah. protocol. And so what you're left with is not knowing if the, if the transactions that you see are toxic or not. And by the way, this doesn't apply just to DEXs. This applies to like NFT mints, which get spammed, sure. um, and other protocols as well. And so what happens is if you have no way of knowing if a transaction is good for the protocol or bad for the protocol, you have to price in the possibility that it's both good and bad. And sure. so the people who are sending you know, the good transactions, the guy just trying to mint an NFT, um, or, or the person just trying to trade tokens on, on chain, they get worse prices. You have to you know, uh, distribute the cost of, of the bad transactions to the good users. Yeah, it's kind of funny because one way to look at this is like an application level stick weighted QoS. Right, the the whole conception of stake weighted QoS is if you're proxying transactions through a staked validator, that validator is in a sense endorsing the quality of transaction that's coming through their quick port. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting to think about that as as something similar here, but it's on the application level as opposed to on sort of the protocol level. Yeah, I, I think that's right. It'll be super interesting to see how endorsers get run, yeah. um, whether validators choose to become their own endorsers, whether the endorsers end up being the big wallets, whether endorsers are unaffiliated third parties. Um, it'll be interesting to see, but I think the benefits are going to be pretty great for the network and for users who are trading on chain. Yeah. So let, let's talk about those endorsers and some of their architecture. So uh, what is the economic incentive to run one um, is are there fees relating to like how Dflow is architected? Like, walk me through a little bit of how this goes from like an objectively good public goods protocol into something that is also a, a long term sustainable business endeavor. Yeah, so that that's a great question. Um, for endorsers, the motivation for being an endorser is going to depend on the types of transactions. That that endorser's algorithm is is good at identifying. Mm -hmm. So let's let's just take an example. Like let's say a large wallet wants to become an endorser. Um, they know or or they have they're they're part of the transaction construction process, right? Sure. So in a sense, they they can become a really good endorser of swap transaction flow. Yep. And if they choose to do that in a way where they've constructed a strong algorithm for this, and you know that can involve machine learning. Um, they, their users get a great experience, and it's great for that wallet's business because their users are now trading at incredible prices, and and the wallet is just getting more users, and and right. that could be a way to incentivize um, running an endorser. Uh, so it's it's this general idea that if you if you are genuinely a a regular user of some protocol. Um, you want your transaction to be endorsed by an endorser who has high quality endorsements, sure. because you get great, you know, benefits on chain from that. Um, so it's it's a new business model for uh, wallets and and kind of like endorsers in a way that's aligned with their users. Um, and then on on the protocol end, uh, the Dflow protocol 
is um, you know basically part of this uh, part of the system where where transactions go on chain, and there's a pretty vast design space there for making this like long term economically sustainable as well. Yeah, I mean, do you see this as something that the DeFi protocols would actually pay to get access to? Is that sort of one of like is is there enough? protection for LPs here that this actually just becomes an operational expense the same way that compliance might be or you know running a front end is an operational expense I think so um, the uh, the order flow on Solana uh, is is pretty toxic and I think for um, for dexes that are on chain, you know we've we've spoken with many and we've spoken with many large market makers on Solana as well that are super active on on order books and and other venues um they they definitely want this they see this hurting their bottom line mm-hmm. and i think uh if if this system existed that problem would be mitigated and it's it's this extremely large economic differential that would be um, realized in favor of liquidity providers and DEXs. And, and so I, I think, yes, for sure. Yeah, interesting. So there's a lot of... Um, it's it's funny because I think there's a lot of different design space this could, could go into. You mentioned how this could even be used in something like NFT Mints. That feels like it's a little bit different than the order flow stuff we've been talking about. That feels like you're moving almost into like a reputation management system here. Is that sort of where you see this evolving if it's successful over the long term? I think reputation systems can be sibled quite easily. Mm. Um, I don't I don't necessarily know if that's the direction that this is going to evolve towards. Um, it is it is possible. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I I haven't thought too much along this vector of whether that's something that happens or or doesn't. Um, but I, I guess we'll just kind of have to see how this plays out. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at the problem space here of like toxic order flow and like price improvements for or liquidity improvements for LPs here, like what do you view as the most impactful things that can be done to improve the situation? Right. I mean, endorser is obviously one big component, but as we sort of talked about, it sounds like there'll be a whole. A whole bunch of order flow that's not passing through endorsement systems. Is it? Uh, do you expect most dexes will start treating that as inherently toxic? Because there, there's one component where you can say, "Oh, we're, we're we're able to assess from an endorsement perspective what is good or neutral order flow." But if the if the bad stuff is not coming through your system, it's hard to assess if it actually is bad. Yeah. Um- there, there are two answers to this question. The first one is maybe a bit of a cop out to say like I don't really know. It's it's kind of the same question of like how do we fix the MEV you know situation yeah. and like stop sandwiching from happening. Um, the the second answer here is uh, I think the uh, the order flow which is unendorsed and which is not coming through an endorsement. Um, they they can permissionlessly still trade on chain, yeah. and it's it's up to the dexes to choose how they believe, like the protocols and the DAOs that design and kind of like set the parameters of these dexes. It's up to them to choose what is the best treatment for unendorsed order flow for the DAO and for the LPs. Um, one option could be keep keep the fees exactly the same, but lower the fees for uh, endorsed flow and. Right. Uh, kind of conversely, raise the fees for unendorsed and keep the flow, uh, keep the fees exactly the same for um, the endorsed flow. So th- it's it's just a big design space, and it's going to depend on on you know multiple DAOs voting on how they want to treat endorsed versus unendorsed flow. Um, but I think creating this like landscape of, of expressiveness and allowing DAOs to have this opinion and express this opinion is market structure that needs to exist and will have a lot of downstream benefits for, for users that just yeah. want to trade. Does this market structure exist in the TradFi space as well? Um, this market structure exists in TradFi if you kind of squint. Uh, there there are definitely some exchanges that allow you to um, quote specifically for uh, like 
brokerages that have retail users and, and offer quotes only to those brokerages while offering a different set of quotes to sort of like the public. Yeah. And uh, it, so so it exists in, in TradFi. Um, and I think this is market structure that has made trading in TradFi pretty good for for uh, retail users of brokerages. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are trade-offs, right? And so it's not a perfect system in TradFi. And hopefully we are making it a perfect system in crypto. Yeah. You know, I think if you go back to the original days of, of DeFi, what, one of the promises was this idea to level the playing field, mm-hmm. that you would no longer have a structural advantage to someone who is trading on a fast lane data feed to an exchange yep. where they've you know paid millions of dollars a year for that access, or they've rented a server at the exchange and they're able to you know send transactions more quickly because of that. Um, there's a component here that feels like the the perceived fairness of first generation DeFi is going away. If we're now giving DEXs the tools to discriminate against, and I don't mean that in a bad term, but they are inherently discriminating. They're, they're choosing between one thing and another. They're discriminating between types of order flow. Do you think that's inevitable for these systems to actually function well? Or is there sort of a long term where you actually could potentially go back to a more fair system if there were other tooling wrapped around it? I would basically point out that the perceived fairness of these first generation DeFi systems is effectively a mirage. Hmm. Because MEV is is rampant today, and you trade on chain and you get sandwiched and you get front run. Um, this is not a fair system. It's far worse than what happens in TradFi. Yeah. Um, and the ethos of of Solana, I think Solana has has, in my opinion, really just done a really excellent job and won crypto. But if if Solana wants to eat TradFi and become something like the next uh, payments infrastructure for worldwide users, it has to solve these problems because the system is inherently unfair as it is today. Yeah. Um, I think the the goal behind Deflow is to bring back that spirit of fairness, or and and do it in a way that's actually fair. Um, right. So that's that's our main goal. Yeah. Yeah. What are some other areas where you see uh, a lacking of tooling or a lacking of ability to uh, sort of upgrade the DeFi experience to start directly competing with more TradFi experiences? Yeah. Well, it's it's all tied together, right? Because um, what you have right now is when something uh, incredible or unique happens in the market, the Solana network becomes congested and it makes it hard for payments applications to work, right? Yeah. Because you know the the validator clients are you know spinning these CPUs, these worldwide global CPUs, um, to filter through spam effectively. And if those hmm. CPUs are spinning at a hundred percent, just filtering through spam, you're not going to land payments transactions on chain, right? So. Um, it's it's all tied together. I think different areas where this will come up. Um, I think one DeFi is probably ninety nine percent of it, and trading within DeFi is probably ninety nine percent of the market size today. Mm. But you know, NFT mints is is another example. Um, I'm sure this stuff happens in in borrow lend protocols where uh, those protocols can um, uh, you know make use of of tooling. Um, but yeah, DeFi and trading is ninety nine percent of it today. I think. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Uh, is there anything else you think is important to this topic we have not chatted about today? Um, the aggregator we're building is um, is the entry point into this entire system. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Tell I me think, a little bit more about that. Yeah. So uh, I think if you look at kind of like the history of on-chain liquidity. Um, you know, you uh, both across Ethereum and Solana and just dr- crypto in general, you have on chain liquidity through AMMs. And that's kind of been the premier way that liquidity has made it on chain. Um, and then after that, you've had aggregators that have been built on top of uh, on top of these AMMs and can basically, uh, you know, defragment all of this fragmented liquidity. Um, and so, Aggregators up till today have done a great job of this and have built really incredible products that allow users to trade with um, much better liquidity than if they had to just go to each individual AMM and trade there. But I think I've, I've, uh, you know, in kind of like the last two and a half years of of building Dflow, 
um, identified uh, a property of these aggregators, which is that they generally optimize over two dimensions. They optimize over price and quantity or liquidity. And um, this is a great thing, but there, there really is a third dimension, which is toxicity of flow. And so our aggregator, uh, we, we want it to be a 3D aggregator. We want it to optimize over price and quantity. And we unlock uh, a kind of like a next level of, of pricing and liquidity improvements by also optimizing over toxicity. Um, so that's, that's where we are today. And uh, super excited about that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, I learned a bunch. It's a good conversation. Thanks for uh, coming on Validated. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks.